Let's, let's turn our Bibles to the book of Judges. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Judges, book of Judges, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Title of the message is 300. 300. 300. You should ring a bell to many of you when you hear 300. Judges chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 300. The Bible says, Judges chapter 7, verse 1, Then Jerubel, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remain ten thousand. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people unto the water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, every one that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that laughed, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that laugh will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Brother Kevin, can you please pray for the message? Amen. Amen. 300. And this is a very familiar story to many of you. Gideon and his 300 men defeating the Midianites. Gideon, you can see in chapter 6, he was not the most mighty man. He wasn't the most well favored, but he has a character. Let's go to Judges chapter 6, verse 15. Judges chapter 6, verse 15. The Bible says, And he said unto him, O my Lord, so Gideon speaking, Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. You can see that Gideon was the least in my father's house. It also shows that God uses least of the people. Amen. God uses people who think they're nothing. In this day and age where everybody's puffing you up, when everybody says you're the best, when kids are growing up, their parents, their psychologists, their school says, whoever you are, whatever you are, because people don't know what they are anymore, you are the best. They're getting rid of all this negativity from everywhere. You know, people learn from negativity. People learn from failures. When people always say that you're okay, you're the best, then they'll never realize. True friends are ones that tell you some, what's wrong with you. If you have something dirty, you know, on your face, you want someone to tell you. 
If you have something dirty on your clothes, you want someone to tell you. But people are so politically correct nowadays, oh, you know, I can't offend anybody. You can't offend anybody. That's why, you know, pulpits are full of hypocrites. Pulpits are full of people who just want to please people's ear. I mean, when do you hear hellfire preaching nowadays? All they talk about is heaven, heaven, paradise. You know, do good and you'll go to some good places. Yes. You know, no one ever talks about sin anymore. Right. No one ever talks about the fact that you are nothing but a sinner. Yes. You know, you're a dirt. Come on, I mean, you're less than nothing according to Isaiah. Amen. When God uses people in the word of God, when God uses people nowadays and our forefathers of faith, they all have one thing in common. They realize that they're least of anything. Amen. If you think you're something, you will not be used by God. Yes. If you think that you're the greatest singer in the world, God's not going to use you. <laughs> if you think you're the smartest person in the world, God's not going to use you. If you think you're the strongest person in the world, God's not going to use you. If you think you're the richest person in the world, God's not going to use you. If you think you're the best debater in the world, God's not going to use you. If you think that you're the best memory verse guy in the world, God's not going to use you. Whatever you think that, or whatever you think that you're the best in the world, God's not going to use you. Yes. I mean, look at the Word of God. The Bible says in verse 2, God says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel find themselves against me. God knows. God knows that if you do anything, and if you think that you did anything on your own, you're just going to get proud. You don't give glory to God. You first give glory to yourself right. or people around you. Well, you know, 99% of the time, you give glory to yourself. And this also shows that people think that if you have numbers on your side, you think you're going to win. And people think that if I have many, many people on my side, I'm going to win. People think that in the war or in a war, if you have the most people, you're going to win. But that's not how God works. From 300, Gideon and the 300, you can learn, number one, God uses few in number. God uses few. God's looking for few good men Amen. and a woman, right? God uses few. Let's turn our Bibles to... Matthew, book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew, chapter 7. That's why we're not here to increase number in attendance. It's good if you are increased with Bible believers, but we're not here to just to bring in people just to make church become big. That's not our goal. And if that's your goal, you're at the wrong place. If you're at a place where you want to see more and more people, you know, of course, if you want to see more Bible-believing Christians show up, hey, that's great. But if your goal is to share with your friends or your family that, hey, you know, we have 1,000 people at our church. Uh, isn't it funny when people, first thing they ask, or some people, I'm, I was at a street preaching, and I was talking to this guy. He goes, how many people do you have? Right. You know, well, Why is that so important? Right. Right? If, if we preach the truth, Stand for King James Bible. Yes. If we do the right thing, if we only have two people, does Amen. that mean that, oh, man, that's not the church being used by God? I mean, what's wrong with you, right? Yeah. You know, let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Bible says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be with which go in entreat in, in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Amen. Think about it. God uses few because God knows that if he wants to get the glory, literally, people have to realize, come to understanding that I can't do anything on my own. So I'm like the least of everything. This day and age, if you go with the populist ideas and populist way, then you're heading for destruction. Right. Yeah. That's how you know we preach, you go against the world, right? right? Yeah. 
if world's going that way, you go the other way. Because, you know, who's the God of this world? I mean, the devil. That's right. I mean, if world says, okay, liberalism, humanism, communism, you know, socialism is the way to go, then you go the other way. Okay? Because a lot of times, you know, masses think what's best for them from the human point of view. They want to bring peace to this earth. It's never going to come until the Lord comes back. But if you're part of people who suddenly start in this protest, you know, I never want to see you guys in the front of the line, you know, with the bullhorn, yeah. you know, for whatever you're, you know, s- protesting about. Right. I mean, as a Bible believer, that's shameful. Yes. I mean, you're supposed to go against that's right. the grain. You guys are supposed to go against the world. Amen. But if you're out there going with them, you know, it, it doesn't go with the word of God. Obviously, there are certain small cases, you know, where it's good things do happen, right? You sign against certain measures, right? You know, that's in accordance with the Bible. Yeah, but they're very far and few in between because majority of the things are against the Word of God. And that's what the Bible says, right? We're in the last days. It's only going to get worse and worse and worse. I mean, those who's very sinful... They're getting all the rights in the world. That's right. And they become like the biggest in the world when they're so minute. Because, why? Because world thinks that, hey, you know, it's people's right, people's right, and people's right. But they never think about God's right. They never, never think about the standard that God has put in place. Then if you don't think about those things, then there's a very, very high chance that your mind will turn. That's why it's dangerous for our young people, old people, anybody who goes to college, yeah. because they start learning about those worldly views and worldly ideas yeah. that is for the people. Right. That's not what God wants. I mean, God works in few. God uses few. Why? Because the world, what happens like Tower of Babel, right? You know, people start congregating together and they start thinking that, you know, I'm going to be like God, you know, let's reach to the heaven, right? I mean, essentially, what is communism and all those ideas about? You know, they want to be gods. Yes. We don't need higher being telling us what to do, Dangerous. you know, because we can do everything on our own. Then what are what the end of all those communism, right? Or it's once that term from communism to whatever else, right? I mean, look at North Korea right now. Look at Cuba. Look at all those you know, third world countries. I mean, look at China, oh. Vietnam, all those places, how they've been. I mean, people don't have freedom. Right. I mean, people can't do whatever they want. There's no freedom of speech. I mean, there's no freedom of you know, nothing. I mean, capitalism doesn't exist That's in those places. Want. Why? Because they want to control people, and they want to exclude, and they want to expel Word of God and you know idea of serving an Almighty God, because they want to be God. Then that's the populist idea. That's what majority of the population thinks. Then as a Bible believer, I've talked to some Bible believers who think that socialism is good. They think that it's good to help everybody. The idea is good, but man, is it according to the word of God? I mean, if you're not doing your best and you don't give the same effort like other people, why should you be treated the same? I mean, you're not doing your work. That's not God's way. If this person puts 20 hours of work and this person puts five hours of work, they don't deserve the same. I'm telling you. Yes. I mean, if you feel that they all deserve same, that's the idea of communism. Well, then why would 20-hour working people act, you know, be like, okay, I'm still going to work 20 hours and get the same benefit as five-hour yeah. person? No. And the standards go down and everything. Right. That's why in a church, you should never have that kind of mentality. Amen. You should never be like, okay, it's for the people. You know, that's what communists and socialist people think. That's why you have to understand that God uses very small, minute amount of people to get his things accomplished. And if you are that minute people, then you're very blessed. That's why there are so few Bible believers out there. 
even though truth is out there. Because many people don't want to give up you know, their way of living, their comfort. They don't want to lose their friends. Now, how many of you, you know, here and listening, where friends have left you because you stood for the truth, yeah. because you share King James Bible? Amen. Man, whenever you say King James Bible, it's like, uh, you know, what is that, hot potato, or you know, it's like a volcano lava. They just start running away. Yeah. You know, I don't know what they're scared of. It's the perfect word of God. But the spirit in them is scared of it, which is the evil spirit, the devil spirit. And they don't realize it. God uses people who think they're least of anything. That's why you have to stay humble. That's why you and I cannot get into this trap that devil sets where, okay, now you're KJV only. You go street preaching. You witness to people. So you're something. You should never think like that. You should always just think that, you know what, I'm just one of those few that, you know, truly understand being least, least of everything is the best of everything. I, I have to check myself on a daily basis yeah. that you know, I'm no better than her. I'm no better than him. Yeah. I'm no better than anybody. I'm no better than lost sinner out there. Yes. I'm no better than saved sinner out there. I'm just least of everything. Then with that mindset, God could use you. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's why it's very important for you and I to constantly, you know, remind ourselves that, you know, hey, hey, John Doe, hey, Jane Smith, you know, you're nothing. You're nothing. I mean, only by grace of God, you're something. So that's why you are nothing. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised as God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You realize that God is the only one who's done good, and God's the only one who can do good, then you can do something. Right? But we're in a spiritual battle. We all understand that. I mean, Gideon was in a physical battle. Right? Oh, Old Testament, you know, you see all this physical battle. But in the New Testament, especially, you know, after everything was done, after the Lord has, you know, said and come and finish what he set out to do, dying for us on the cross. It's not about going out there for us to physically battle, you know, a spiritual battle. You have to realize it. That's why, you know, man, you know, you do have temper. It's not for you to be out there and when you're street preaching to start fighting with people yeah. if they don't accept, you know, or if they start throwing things at you, of course, or, you know, punch you in the face or whatnot. I mean, there are a couple of ways you do have to defend yourself, but you're not to be out there, have five people right over there, and then five people walking by, and they reject the gospel, and you start fighting them physically. You know, that's not how we do it. It just tells you that how God thinks and how human thinks are different. As we see in verse 2, we saw it. So Gideon has 32,000 men, and there's like over 100,000 Midianites out there. It's already a tough battle, you know, in human beings' thought. But Gideon knows you know, in chapter 6, God showed all the signs you know, who he is, right? And, but as a human being, you still have some kind of doubt, right? right? So imagine you're literally in a battle. There's like, you know, hundreds, thousands, millionites out there. And you have 32,000. So they're already, you know, three, fourfold, you know, more than you. 
can you uh, think about you fighting one against four? You know, maybe some of you guys are fighters. Maybe you're good, right? You've done some jujitsu like you know, Brother Reagan and Brother Fernandez, and maybe you could handle some people, right? Well, I don't know. I mean, if I see, a, say, Sayla back there, I don't know if you know, Sayla's going to handle like four people, four, four, I mean, not adults, but four kids coming after her and then just fight them off, you know? Maybe she can but already all stacked against you, and then Lord drops it, drops it to 10,000. Yes. So, I mean, if Midianites, you know, were like 135,000 or so, let's see. You know, that's like, you know, more than 10 to 1. Yeah. Right? And then we go on the story, and then Lord says, you know, that's still too many. Let's bring it down to 300. Then it becomes like what? You know, you mass wizards, right? You know, 300 against uh, like 135,000. What is it? Like 500 to one, 400 to one. So you're, one person is fighting what? Like 400 people once. I know, I know Matthew's big, right? He's strong. <laughs> but imagining, you know, five, 400 hooligans fighting against him as tree preaching at a corner. Wow. I, it's got to be very tough for him yeah. to fend off that many people. So in human beings' idea, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah, impossible. I don't care who you are. After you fend up, say, 100 people, next 300 is going to be really tough. Yeah. Right? I mean, even if you get rid of them like, I don't know, you're such a great fighter, maybe per second. You know, it's, it's got to be hard to stand for 400 seconds trying to get rid of 400 people. Yes. Who's not out there to just hurt you? Who's out there to kill you? So that's a big difference. Yes. When someone's coming after you trying to kill you, you know, it's got to be hard to fend off not just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, but, you know, like hundreds of them. And that's the situation Gideon's in. Think about it. And a lot of times, that's the situation you're in, in a spiritual battle. You have so many, so many, these people full of the devil out there attacking you. Yes. They're criticizing you. They're, they're, you know, downright, you know, tearing you apart. Right. And you think that, ah, I can't win this battle. I'm too small. I'm too weak. I, mean, I think I'm strong, but I can't handle that many people. That's when God's going to use you. you got to get to that point where you come to a realization that, you know, I'm truly nothing because, I mean, how am I going to be able to fight against these evil forces out there? How am I going to, you know, stand up against them? That's when God says, you know, you're in the right place. That's when you can win because when you realize 1,000 plan in your person in your heart that I cannot win this battle, then that's where you can trust the Lord. Lord, you need to fight for me. Yes. I trust you. And many times, just like the story of Gideon and many stories like Joshua, Lord does not do it in a conventional way. Lord uses like foolish things in the human being's brain then you know that God can do mighty things. God can do impossible things. Yes. Then you have to understand that, you know what? God uses small number of people, least of the people, to do his will. Then I have to understand that I'm that least of people. If you feel like you could do something, then you're going to be that large population and large percentage Who's going to leave? Yes. Like, if you're afraid, then leave this battle. Man, you're the type of person, you know, and then you start thinking about your reputation. You start thinking about your finances. You start thinking about your health. You start thinking about your family. You start thinking about every little thing. I'm like, Lord, you know, I can't do it. I can't. Then we go to our second point. What can you learn? 
If you want to do Lord's ministry, you can't have fear. You can't have fear of man. Oh, obviously, you fear God. That's it. Why do you think people are afraid? They're looking at man everywhere. Yes. They're like, wow, man. Look at all those media nights out there. I'm afraid. That's why they left. Just like that. I'm pretty sure they're gung-ho about it. You know, when Gideon and I, I'm Gideon said, who wants to fight? They're like, okay, 32,000. But he asked a second question. You know, if you're afraid, right? You could leave. Then you start trying to think about the ways to get out of the battle. Okay, I have a family to take care of. Can't go. I can't give up this. Go. I've seen people lose their limbs, so I can't go. You know, I mean, I'm gonna lose my job. I can't go. Well, I mean, there are too much things for me to give up. Then you're going to be those people who's going to regret for the rest of your life. Because of things of the world, because of your own care, you are fearful. And you, let, you, you just left the army. Yes. You, know? you just left the army of Christ. You deserted the army. That's the correct way of saying it, right? Because when you're saved, whether you like it or not, you are in the army of Christ. Amen. Right? But there are many people who don't do anything in the you know, service. They're just there. But you, if you have fear other than the you know, almighty God, then what's going to happen? You got to be those out of 32,000, right? You got to be those, you know, 20, 31,700. We're just not going to go to the battle. You know, that is a great percentage, yes, it is. and it is a scary percentage. 300 out of 32,000. I mean, but these are the people who actually said, I'm going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Aren't you guys the Bible believers who says, I'm going to stand up for King James Bible. I'm going to stand up for truth. Amen. And out of you guys, what is it? What's what 300 out of 32? 2,000, what percentage is that? I, I, I mean, what, what is it? 3,000, like, so less than 1%. So less than 1% is going to actually do something for the Lord? And I'm not talking about the big picture or everybody else, you know, just safe Christians in general. I'm talking about people who says, I'm going to do something for the Lord. And out of hundred. Only one will stand for the Lord. And sometimes, you know, I talk to Sister Tracy and some brethren as well. You know, when we see Israelites, those spies, right? Only Joshua and Caleb. So like that's, you know, two out of 12 who trusted the Lord and stood for the Lord. And then who stood behind Moses, right? So 10 of them just deserted and left. I thought that percentage was low. But when we look at Gideon, yeah. 300 out of 32,000, that's very low. Which means, me included, only one out of 100 would actually do something for the Lord, who claims to you know, be a Bible-believing Christian, standing up for King James, you know, calling yourself Rachmanite and doing you know, going out there, street preaching, you know, visitation, all that. Only one at the end of the day. Yes. I mean, that's a scary percentage. Unless you humble yourself, you're going to be that 99%. So don't kid yourself that, you know, I'm going to be continuing to going on in a Bible-believing church, serving local church. You know, that's false, how should I say, humility. You take day at a time. One day at a time. Because today you could turn. Yes. You know? That's why it's scary. A lot of times church splits happen because of people who pass their trust the most turn against them. So-called right-hand people. So-called teachers. So-called people who have some roles in the church. 
because they get big-headed. Because they think that there's something. OK, I'm teaching little kids. I need to teach older kids now. Where's the progression? This ain't your worldly job, right? OK, I've been teaching for five years now. OK, I'm waiting and waiting. I'm something, you know. Now, I teach the kids the best. Or you're like, you know, you're teaching the boys, you know, or middle school kids, you know. You know what? You know, I'm tired of teaching these middle school kids, you know. When am I going to teach high school kids? Uh, oh, man. I've been teaching high school kids for the last five years. When am I going to teach, you know, college kids? You know, you know what's Pastor going to let me do anything, right? <laughs> man, then you start thinking and you start forming a clique because there are people always. Believe it or not, there are people who's always a complainer and always wants to know other people's business, right? Yeah. You know, and they're like, okay. Let's talk offline. I mean, once people start saying that to you, you know, there's some alarm, right? It's just between you and me. And usually it's not just between you and you, you know? Usually that person already talked to other people. Yeah, like, it's just between you and me, you know. But I don't like this policy, you know, at the church. You know, I don't like the fact that, you know, the teachers are mean, you know. I don't like the fact that, you know, we have to dress in a certain way. You know? I don't like the fact that blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And then they start that those complaints, you know, it becomes contagious to other folks. And then what happens? You know, they rebel against the pastor, and then they leave the church. And then it's not only them. More people leave. So in the beginning of our ministry, you know, we had you know, a family, you know, so-called someone who was really faithful, you know, went against the pastor. He left, and then like total like 30 people left. Does that happen just overnight? No, because you don't think how vulnerable, how weak you are. And you start fearing man more than God. And you start becoming proud, considered. You vaunt yourself that I'm something. Always remember, you and I are nothing. You and I are nothing in front of an almighty God. You and I are only saved by grace. Thank That's you. it. That's it. The fact that the Lord has given you and me the perfect word of God, giving us opportunity to come to local church and participate in ministry, I mean, that is greatest blessing. Amen. And you should be thankful. You should embrace it. And you should give thanks to God every single day for that. Instead of saying to yourself, so-and-so is doing this. Why am I not doing it? I mean, is there a favoritism? You know, I don't, you know, my head hurts when I think about favoritism. I don't have time to be more favorable to you or to other person, right? You know, I have other things to, you know, worry about. I mean, I just want everyone in the flock, everybody here to just grow and do something for God. I mean, that's all I want. And, you know, love each other, you know, with brotherly love. I mean, that's enough, right? Amen. That's enough for you. you. You already have enough things to do. You don't need to worry about other people. You don't need to worry about, you know, just pray for me, my health, you know, and everything else. But you don't need to pray about, I mean, worry about what I do every single day, right? Because I don't care about what you do every single day, right? I just want you to stay healthy and serve the Lord the best way you can and Amen. sin as little as possible, yeah. be as holy as possible. Amen. That's what you want. Yeah. People who are not afraid, people who wants to serve the Lord, they always stand for man of God. That's one of the characteristics. These 300 stood yeah. with Gideon. Amen. When 99% deserted, they still stood with him. I mean, God forbid that's the percentage here right now. If I'm looking at you, maybe one or two will stay, you know. But that's, that's the, you know, harsh, harsh reality. 
And that's the expectation I have. I, mean, I don't know if you've heard Pastor Gene's testimony. Think about it. The Lord was blessing his ministry, you know, four or five years, went to, you know, 30 people. Year five, he dropped to two. And we have brothers and sisters when he did ministry in, in Palm Springs area, Cathedral City. They know how hard he works, how faithful he is. But he dropped. What, are, what happened to those 30 people? That's one out of 15 at the end, after five years. Does it guarantee that you'll be here five years from now? You could be that, you know, 14 who leaves and one that stays. Yes. That area has about 15 people. Only one might stay and just leave. And there's, so that means that there's going to be a time where you have to stand for God, where you have to stand for man of God, where you can't be fearful of man. And you just got to be like, you know what? I don't care how much you criticize me. I know this is the right church. I know this is the right place for me to be in. Then I'm going to stay. Amen. You could desert me as your son. You could desert me as your daughter. You could hate me forever, right? doesn't matter. I'm going to stand for what's right and who is standing for the word of God. But of course, you know, you know, years later, the Lord has blessed his ministry. Same thing with us, right? In the beginning of ministry, especially after those 30 people left, I don't know. I mean, it is devastating, right? To see the people, especially Pastor Kim, you know, care for, you know, who he trusted, just leaves just like that. Then you and I must understand that if we don't fear God, we could, we could be just like them tomorrow. Right. So don't fool yourself and thinking that I'm different than others. You're not. There's nothing new under the sun. You are not different than me. You're not different than others. I'm not different than you. We could always fall. Yeah. We could always sin. Amen. And we could always be that person who will say, Pastor, you, I don't like you, and you're the devil, right? Yeah. And then just leave the church. Right. But I'm going to go out with a bang. I'm going to take as many people as with me. Oh. Believe it or not, in the ministry, nobody comes back. They know they've done wrong. They know they have nowhere else to go. But because they're pride, right. they can't come back. Isn't it funny? You'd think it would be easy, right? Like you have nowhere to go. You feel really lonely. You, know? yeah. you want to share faith and you want to have fellowship with others. But you still have the pride. But, you know, I've done something. I have to at least be a man be a woman, and I can't admit my fault. How foolish, right. right? You let your pride get in the way of getting right with the Lord. Then if you fear anything other than God in your Christian walk, especially recently right now, you have to repent. You have to get right with the Lord. Lord, you know, I repent the fact that I fear man, I fear man at work, you know, I fear man at school, I fear man everywhere around me, and I was being a coward, I wasn't really, you know, fighting in this spiritual battle, and you have to get right with the Lord, as Lord gives you chance after chance. You know, someday, you're going to expire, you're going to lose all the chances, right? What is it, the game, Monopoly, get out of jail pass? You know, thank God that he has given you many, many. Amen. But once it's time, yes. then you have to pay for it, then you can't get out. Right. You're stuck there. Then time's up, as they say. You can't do anything. Wouldn't it, be, I mean, think about all those people, 31,700, who had chance to be in the victorious battle against Midianites. But they gave it up for many reasons. Because they fear man. You know? Because they were thinking about 
calculating all the you know, benefits that they, they'll get if they participate. And then they see that they come back victorious. How much regret do you think they're going through? How much regret do you think you'll go through at the judgment seat of Christ? Like, oh man, for, for I mean, I gave up so much yes. because of my selfish ways, because of my pride, because I good. fear man. Yes. Again, I'm not telling you to be a pompous, have a, you know, this, you know, know it all attitude, like, I don't fear you, man, I only fear God, you know. But that's not a good attitude either. I mean, you can't be like, hey, you know, when you're trying to witness and then they reject you, man, I don't fear you, man. You don't hurt me or anything, right? You know, I only fear God. Just don't burn in hell. And they just leave like that. That's not a good attitude. And you know what I'm talking about? This fearing man is that if you have to choose between God and man, you're going to choose God. Amen. If there's a situation that comes to you, and then you know clearly from the word of God that I have to go this way, then you just go that way no matter what. Yes. You go that way because you don't care about hurting their feelings because you don't want to hurt God's feelings. Amen. And who, do you wanna, who would you rather hurt feelings, God or man? Yeah. When I think about it, it's like, okay, if your kid is being rebellious to you and he's, they're not obeying you, like the Bible says. But you don't want confrontation. And you know you're going to hurt their feeling if you, you know, lecture them and chastise them. Okay. You know, so to avoid confrontation, I'm just going to say, it's okay, it's okay. What does that show? You don't fear God. Right. You fear your kid. You fear man. Even at, you know, work or anywhere else. Use your wisdom. But if they tell you, okay, let's go to a drinking party. You're not supposed to. If God, if you fear God, you're going to say no. Yes. You know, as much as, you know, I respect the company, you know, I guess what, group, team, whatever it is. But as a Christian, you know, I don't drink. I hope you respect that. That's it. That's how you got to stand up, right? Simple. Either you choose God's way or man's way. That's it. But the best part is that when you choose God's way, he has something waiting for you. He has blessing and reward waiting for you, whether it's right now spiritually or thousand-year kingdom. You know, he has something waiting for you. So don't forget that, you know, we're not doing it for that reason only. We do it because we love the Lord and fear God. Amen. But we also know that he's capitalist. We also know that he rewards accordingly. You give up something for God, God's going to bless you more and more. And then if a Christian understands that, they're like, you know what? This life is just temporary. Yes. I mean, how much longer am I going to live? Yeah. Especially if the Lord's going to come back soon, which we believe. I mean, how long is it going to be? Even if Lord tarries, right? Uh, what, like until 90, 80, right? Uh, and time goes by so fast. Sure does. So before you know it, man, your time to die. Woo! Let's go. Then you're going to start remembering what you've done for the Lord. Amen. How you stood up for the Lord, yes. his church, his man, his woman, and everything. Woo! Then you'll be like, okay, man. And no, even though I was nothing, I was least of everything. Just like how God gave grace, how God used Gideon. And I'm thankful that God used me like Gideon. Man, I don't deserve to be that 1% serving the Lord. But man, thank God that he has given me that opportunity. And still to this day, even though I'm 80, 90, I could still fall. But I thank God each day, God has provided me with my needs. God has given me blessing. And then the fact that, you know, I thank God. I feared him more than man. Man, that's a great legacy. You know, before you leave here, you know, to be with the Lord, I fear 
you more, Lord, than man. I feared you a lot more than man. Man, I just feared you than man, period. Man, that should be our testimony. Then you could be like 300. You know, it's not a far-fetched idea. It's not impossibility. Wherever you are in your Christian life, you can be that 300. Gideon and the 300. Understand that God used the least of people. God uses few. And understand that you need to fear God rather than man. Just do what God says. That's it. If someone says otherwise, don't do it. What can man do unto me, right? When the Lord is inside of me, what can man do unto me when God, Almighty God, is the controller of everything? What can man do unto me when at the end of the day, it's me and the Lord for all eternity? Hey. Man, that's all I want to think yes. about, right? If I hurt your feelings, I'm sorry, right? But I have to follow God. Amen. You cry, I'm sorry, I have to follow God. Amen. You punch me, I'm sorry, I have to follow God, right? <laughs> but God will reconcile, God will reward, God will give you more the blessings when you follow him, when you fear him, when you choose him instead of, anything else. That's it. Then it makes our Christian walk very simple. Choose God, not choose man. Fear God, don't fear man. Do what the Bible says if they tell you otherwise. Then you and I could beat that Gideon and 300. Let's pray.